professor from UVM by the name of Jay Nodell, a well-known economist. Um, and as I said, a professor at UVM who's agreed to talk to us tonight about the state of the economy. And thank you, Jane, for being here. Um, and I'm very happy to see you, especially tonight. But things are in such flux about our economy, I have no idea even where to begin. So maybe I should let you begin and have you give us some kind of an assessment of where the United States is at. Um, I don't know how you can comment yet on what the current changes about this war are going to be, but I'll let you say whatever you would like to say about the state of our economy, okay? Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much for in inviting me, Sandy. Um, it's given me a chance to kind of try to organize my own thoughts. And as you say, it's we're in a period of a lot of change and a lot of flex, and it's hard to know exactly the direction we're headed. I'm going to try to share my screen. Okay. Okay. Um, just... So, Jane, I think I just need to make you host. Okay. So just hold on for one second. And that should come through now. Okay. So let's see if I can. Does that mean big two? Oh. By the way, I also want to say to about Jane. She's actually, uh, I would say, more than a professor. She is also an activist, a political activist in our town has served on city council for years, is no longer on city council, but still is very active in at least thinking about local politics and the local economy. And that's how, I guess how I know her best is as, as an active thinker and an activist in terms of uh, local politics, which are very important. Anyway. Thanks, so, Annie. So my, I had to change my preferences on Zoom here. So I'm just gonna talk through. Um, my comments and I'd love, let me know if you want to break in at any time um, or if anything I'm saying doesn't make sense. It's probably the case. Yeah, so ahead. I guess my question for myself is that I, is whether we are heading into another supply side global economic crisis. So um, let me just say something about aggregate demand problems and aggregate supply problems. So I'm like a 20th century Keynesian slash Marxist kind of economist. And I always use a kind of Keynes's framework to think about the economy, which in the 20th century US economy, the problem was how do you, how do you deal with unemployment? Mm. And the fact that you, all, you, you aren't really using the full productive capacity of the economy to employ people and to provide people with incomes. Um, so like the Great Depression, right, was an aggregate demand crisis, collapse of aggregate demand, lots of people out of work because no one had, people had less income to buy goods and services, so firms were producing less output, right? Same kind of problem with the global financial crisis of 2007 to 2009. But the pandemic was a supply side crisis, right? Because that was that started in the service sector where we were all shut down. We weren't like going out to eat, we weren't going to movies, we weren't going out to, you know, working out in gyms, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and so there, there's a contraction of people's incomes that's coming from the supply side of the economy. Um, starts in the service sector and then kind of spreads to other sectors. So when we think of this, you know, in terms of the, the timing of things, so in 2020 was when the, you know, pandemic, the initial shutdown started. And then we had these multiple waves, right, of the pandemic. Um, the economy would kind of start to come back and then we would like retreat back and there'd be a fall in supply, a fall in incomes again. Um, in 2021, there we kind of started to loosen up a little bit, especially towards the end of the year, and the aggregate demand started to pick up. So we started to feel like, oh, we're kind of getting back to normal. 
But we had these labor shortages, which were a legacy of the pandemic, where many people in the service sector were actually had higher incomes being unemployed and getting federal government um, money relief payments, mm -hmm. right? They were making more income than they were when they were working. So that created this awareness of, you know, why am I, you know, why am I working for these lousy wages? I'm going to find some other way, you know, try to get by some other way. Um, and so we know that there's been all these labor shortages and, you know, that we're seeing in Vermont there, you know, throughout the U.S. economy. This is going to be my phone ringing. Hang on. Let me just tell okay. her. I'll call yeah. back. I got to call you back, Kurt. Okay, good. Okay. Um, that always happens. Phone rings in the middle of the presentation. So in 2021, man, demand picked up, but we had these labor shortages and then also transportation bottlenecks, right? Like, the Could I ask you something? So yeah, this forward. labor shortage, was it because people didn't feel like going back to work? Because as you said, they were getting more money without going to work. Is that true? I, th I think it's true. Uh -huh. but I think maybe, of course, they can only, you can only do that for so long, but maybe they yeah. decide to go and, you know, get a, you know, some kind of new certification, do some more education to get some other job, right? Mm -hmm. Um so we started to see consumer prices start to rise last year. So it was already something that people were talking about. So here we are in February 20, 2022, you know, February 25th, right? The invasion, the assault of Ukraine, which, you know, is a catastrophe, a tragedy. Here we're talking about just the economics of it, which yeah, almost right. feels like absurd to even talk about it, but I will anyway. Um, so this is another supply shock, but it's a shock to basic commodities, energy and food, right? So we're seeing all these rising oil prices, rising gas prices. That's due in part to buyers not wanting to buy the Russian product, right? But also speculators in the market that are driving up the price of oil because they think the prices will continue to go up and they want to buy buy now, hold it, sell it later, and make a speculative gain. We have those two things going on in the oil price and the oil and oil markets. And then also there's a big food shock because Russia and Ukraine are like bread baskets, bread baskets right. in the global economy. Ukraine, Ukraine, grain, wheat, especially, corn, sunflower oil. You know these kind of essential products that you know are especially developing certain development economies like India um, consumes a lot of. So this this supply shock is is being felt as higher prices, right, of energy and food, and this is particularly problematic for low and moderate income households, income sure. households for whom food and energy make up a very large proportion of their household budgets. So it's going to have a hugely adverse distributive effect. That is, it's going to make the distri distribution of real living standards. It's going to press living standards for large numbers of households, while others will, you know, will barely feel it, right? Barely feel it. So, I mean, what what should the you know what should the economic policy be and what what will probably happen is that the fed will very moderately raise interest rates why why well because they're worried about core inflation so they make it they make a distinguish be they make a they distinguish between fluctuation in in energy and food prices and then when you remove that, you have like all the like industrial goods, manufactured goods. Mm -hmm. okay. So I think their thinking is that as long as they want to walk, watch that core inflation, they think that maybe the oil and energy stuff will be short-lived and they don't really have to respond to that. 
But if there's, you know, inflation in these other commodities, they want to slow that down a bit. Um, remains to be seen, but I think that they will do something. It won't be a drastic increase in interest rates. But we, but as a general rule, we don't have very good tools, policy tools for dealing with inflation. That's right. just a fact. I mean, the way that we we manage the inflation of the late seventies was by engineering a very deep recession, right? What do you, what do you mean engineering? Well, the Fed. This uh -huh. is Volcker Fed. They brought about an in you know huge increase in interest rates, right? They're double digit interest rates. Oh uh, yeah. So at, at some point, if you increase interest rates enough, eventually you will produce a recession. Reduces demand and then prices come okay. down. Demand is lower. Mm -hmm. um, very blunt instrument to be, you know, to put it mildly. We don't have great policies for dealing with inflation, although um, in war, in World War II, we did use wage, right. you know, price controls. Price controls, right. Price controls. Right. Which is combined with rationing. Wow, well, well, yeah. Which, you know, people don't like price controls, but if you can administer them with some competence, it means that you can manage the kind of the, the unfair distributive impact of the higher prices. Right? You can say, mm -hmm. or are we, are you, you know, we, if everyone got ration tickets, so you got so much gasoline, you know, at X price that people could afford, mm -hmm. um, you know, it would be a way of managing it, but we're probably not going to do that. So we, we don't have a good way to cushion the impact of higher prices on income constrained households. We just don't, mm -hmm. you know, unless we, um, you know, come back, go back to the relief checks, you know, the fiscal oh. stimulus checks, just to help people with the added cost. But and that will cause further inflation, right? Well, I don't really think so. No? I don't really think so. Um, uh, I mean, if you... I mean, low income, you know, mod income constrained people are, are, are buying food, they're buying heat for their homes, they're buying medicines, things like that. Um, you, you should possibly, you know, then there is the whole supply side of it, right? Do you try to increase energy production in the short run? You know, we probably should do that, but some kinds of, you know, is it going to be oil and gas, which is probably easiest to scale up very quickly versus the renewables? You know, there's going to be a big debate about that. Right, right. Um, could, you, could you explain that? Is that the debate about renewable energy and green energy and all that? Is that what's really happening? Like the climate change people are arguing against fossil fuel, correct? Yes. And so is that the nature of the debate? If you increase production as I guess the Republicans would like to do, correct? Yes. But the Democrats and the green new, green energy people really don't want to increase production. Is that fair enough to say? Yes. Okay. I mean, they would like to see an increase in renew production of renewable energy, right? Wind and solar. Right. Um, so I'm not an, an engineer. I don't know the, you know, but there's arguments about whether in the short run you'd be able to increase output of those forms of energy, right? which also need to get, you know, input into the distribution system. So you need right. the capacity, you need the storage, right. be able to store it, you know. So um, if you, if you, you we're going to need some kind of increase in energy supplies domestically if we want to moderate the effect on prices. I mean, in okay, this, right. this effect, right. right? Or, or are you going to buy it from Venezuela? You're going to buy it from Iran, you know, and these other countries that have, you know, arguably problematic 
you know, human rights and, you know, democratic governance kinds of records as well. Well, I think the most shocking proposal is that we buy it from Saudi Arabia. I mean, that to me is, is really a country that has a, not a great human rights record, right? Right. But anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. No, that's okay. And then, you know, food policy. We don't, you know, when did you ever hear us that having a food policy? I mean, in Vermont, we've got lots of actually really, really good plans around energy and also the food system. Um, do we need to resume some of the food security programs of the pandemic? You know, um, I think there's going to be more, you know, food insecurity out there, you know, the longer this goes on. Uh, of, of course, a lot depends on how long this, this war goes on and just how much disruption to um, the flow of these supplies of energy and food mm -hmm. is happen, right? Mm -hmm. So let me just, I mean, a kind of thinking beyond just what's going right now, it's like, well, what's going, are there some major shifts going on globally? And this is all just speculation, but you know, a lot, I think a lot depends on what China decides to do. Exactly, right. Right? If, if China goes ahead and cozies up to Russia and says, you know, strategically, it's wise for us to help them, right? To keep buying their oil and gas. Um, and to, then I think we're gonna see, see Russia and China form kind of a real trading block. Right. Um, that will have a lot of influence in the Far East, um, South, South Asia, very possibly. And then there would be these trading blocks that are based on geopolitical and military kinds of alignments, right? And so it's kind of like so much for globalization. Of course, many people thought that was a mixed bag anyway. Right. Um, but that's definitely something that, that, could, that could take place. Um, could with some possible effects on the dollar. I mean, I'm going to come back to that. Yeah, I'm right. I'm very interested in the, is yeah. the dollar losing its shine? Um, I think we're going to see national, national, national governments say we need to do more about energy and food security, right? Then we need to produce, we need to be, try to be more self-sufficient or, or shift our supply to, you know, sources that we feel are reliable, long-term friends and partners. Um, certainly many in Europe are wishing that they had not opened up so much and gotten so reliant on, on Russian energy su supplies, right? Um, and then I think we're gonna see, unfortunately, growing defense budgets. You know, and people say we need to be, you know, we need to be ready for anything. And if this can happen, you know, who knows what's gonna happen next. Mm -hmm. Probably the last thing, you know, not not moving in the direction that, that we'd wanted, but a, a increase increase emphasis on just, you know, securing our, you know, the supplies of things that our people need. Mm -hmm. It's like a shift to a shortage economy. Well, and that happened obviously in World War II, correct? That that's correct. Right. That's correct. So anyway, okay. So if I'd love to hear what other people think and, you know, are you, um, I didn't talk much about housing, um, but it's just, you know, I think I'm really thinking about these basic economy, these basic commodities. And like I said, the, the impacts will be very unequal. A lot of people will really feel it and, and others won't, won't really notice it, but that's probably the that's way. That's the way it always is though, isn't it? That's the way it always is. That's right. Does anybody else have any thoughts? I did have a question, but does anybody else have a, a question or a comment? No? Okay, well, Biden announced, as everybody knows, um, that we are no longer gonna buy Russian oil, correct? So what does that all mean? I mean, is that, and most people are predicting therefore that the price of gas for our cars and all of the need for oil are, is going to skyrocket and we as the american people are going to be asked to pay for that right i'm not certain and i guess it's assumed that we'll all be okay with that because we are protecting ukraine 
So there's two questions. What will happen as a result of this cutoff of purchase of Russian oil? And secondly, are Americans willing to pay that political price to protect Ukraine? Essentially, isn't that what we're trying? It, the policy, it appears to me, is a political decision that Ukraine has to be protected. That might be good or bad. I'm not suggesting good or bad. I'm just asking, do you think that Americans are willing to pay to protect Ukraine with higher prices? Hmm. That's a good question, Sandy. I mean, um... I don't think so, to tell you the truth. Don't I don't so. think so. No, I don't. I mean, we've got, you know, obviously a bipartisan consensus. Around. Yes, yes, we do. I know it. To the extent that those people are in touch with their people back That's home. That's what I'm talking about, yeah. To, to the extent that they are in touch with their people back home. Um, now, remember, a lot of them, you know, a lot of Republicans represent um, states that have a lot of agriculture, yep. right, and energy. Yes. Yes. Okay, so 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 producers of energy and food are going to be better off, right? There's re a lot of redistribution that goes on in an inflation like this, and if you're producing these now scarce commodities, you're going to be good. I mean, it's a good people who grow wheat in the United States are going to have a good year, right? Mm -hmm. Um. So it may be that that may be part of what's behind this bipartisan consensus. Now, what people who are gonna be really hurt by it are you know, rural Vermonters who need to drive a lot every day to get to work. And it's gonna just really you know, eat, into their, eat into their household budgets. But how does, how, does, how, does their, how does that really translate into the centers of power in Washington, DC? They don't care. Probably. What you said is, is really, I think, true, is they are not interested in reality. They're not, the, the politicians as I see it, and this is my, I suppose, value judgment, the politicians are acting as if poor people don't exist. I mean, they always have, let's face it, probably they always have, poor people and working class people. They're expecting those people to pay these prices without even asking us. They're deciding these issues without any sense of how people are already living because of the pandemic. Yeah. And, and I find that that's gonna be, in my mind, a political crisis, not just for the Democrats, but also for all of the politicians and will lead to a failure of confidence in the government. They, they act as if, they act as if all of us are willing to or can even are able to pay these higher prices, and most people can't. Yeah. yeah. What's interesting is, like in developing countries, they have they're actually better positioned to subsidize um, household purchases of key commodities for low-income households. Like they have right. programs in place, right? Yeah. So we don't have anything like that. So it'd be one thing if we did have that that you could say. We need to do this because we can't let Russia prevail, right? right? right. We, so we are bound by, you know, because we don't want to start a nuclear war, there's a limit to what we can do militarily. Um, however, you know, the whole economic sanctions strategy seems to be that eventually we will inflict so much economic harm on Russia that they'll have to stop the war. Do you believe that? I think that's the thinking behind the sanctions. I know, I do too. I think that is the thinking. I'm asking if it's, I don't think it's real. Well, I think it all depends. We need some, we need a Russia specialist. I think you're, yeah. you, you yeah. need a show on Russia and Ukraine. Because right. like, what is the mechanism for getting Putin out of power? I mean, you know. And well, what? there are elections, uh, obviously, but I don't think Putin's going to get out of power because I think he's fairly popular. Of course, that's another bit of information that we are being told by our government that the, the people of Russia will eventually rise up against him and kick him out. I think he's quite popular in Russia. And finally, somebody in our media said that today, that he has the support 
of the Russian people, even in this war. Now, it might be based on his disinformation, because yeah. he is saying about this war that it's because he wants to denazify Ukraine. Most Americans don't believe that, but Russians might. Yeah, no, I get it. Well, then I guess the other part of the sanctions theory is that at some point he, he needs resources to continue to right. wage the war, right? right? So once he has no resources to keep, you know, pouring munitions in there or whatever, you know, he needs to... Then, then, then he has to stop. Then he can't keep going. But okay. I think that will probably take a very long time. Me too. Wow. Me too. I'm glad you said that. Me too. I think so too. Look at how they performed in World War II with very few resources. They have a lot of people, though. Right. Yeah, people. So anyway. Yeah. So I mean, but politically, you know, I think I think they're going to if it if the higher oil prices have go on for a long time. I think they're going to have to come up with some way of helping helping income constrained households deal with that hit. Oh, which side? Us or them? The us. Yeah, me too. Yeah, right, right. Exactly. But will that happen? I mean, do you see that where is all this heading? Um, the economic, I mean, the economic collapse to me began also during the pandemic. You shut down the entire economy, uh -huh. right? I mean, isn't that really what happened? Yep. Almost. Yep. I mean, it was mainly the service sector, right? But it, you know, that's a big part of the economy. Right. And you gave people, essentially, you gave people money during that period of time. Was that, I, I mean, I have, has the United States recovered from that in the first place? You're still talking about labor shortages. Is that still happening that people aren't? Well, I mean, actually that's, that's a little bit of a kind of a bright spot in an odd way, which is um, we have tight labor markets, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. when you have tight labor markets, employers have to pay people higher wages and better benefits to get them to work for them. So, and people are expecting better wages and benefits coming out of the pandemic. Um, so, so when there's a tight labor market, that will lead to a redistribution, mm -hmm. I think, away from capital and to, to labor. So I think that that's not all bad. Businesses right. having right. to bid up wages right. and benefits right. in order to get people to work with and improve the working conditions and let them work remotely if they want to, you know, so that's the, the bargaining power of labor is actually good right now, mm -hmm. which is, which is quite different from, you know, pre previous day, you know, the past really. Except during world war two. Right. That was a, also kind of a tight, you know, kind of, so we always, you know, as Keynesian economists would always point to say, you know, Sweden, these kind of countries, right. they have perpetually tight labor markets um, huh. by policy. Um, and that's good for labor. Uh -huh. So that's a, that's a bit of a bright spot if we, and I think that that, um, that will end up being a good thing in the long run. Okay, does anybody else have thoughts or questions? Anyone? Because I wanted to talk to Jane also about, I think, an emerging financial system that's also emerging out of this war, but prior to the war. I uh, have a friend uh, in New York City who trades gold. And he has for a long time asserted that Americans' dollar is really losing its power. One of the things also that he emailed me recently was the fact that he believes that China and Russia are going to develop a whole new financial system that de-dollarizes uh, our dollar. In other words, uh, we'll try to make the dollar not as universally valuable in international trade and that they're going to have some kind of a currency that will be, I guess, more valuable and that will get around the dollar. Now, what is that in any way 
coming or what? What's a, what, what is your thought about that? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, Russia, like Russia right now has been cut off from MasterCard, Visa. Right, right. Um, we froze the assets of the, the Russian Central Bank that were sitting in the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Um, Whatever that means too, but. Well, their bank, the Russian Central Bank had a deposit at the Federal Reserve Bank of, of New York. They kept okay. some of their reserves, cash reserves there at the New York Fed. And that's why we were able to freeze that. They had some reserves as gold and we, you know, we can't really touch that. That's a global commodity, right? Mm -hmm. So it is the case that Russia now is, is being able to sell and buy with China, which would be the beginning of you know, that trading block, which always has this monetary or financial aspect to it. Right. Right. Because if you're trading goods, so you need some way of you know, paying for it, some kind of money. Um, so I could see that happening, but, and then the, the dollar, to the extent that those parties are using dollars, they wouldn't be using dollars anymore. Um, but it, that doesn't mean that the Chinese currency would become like a global currency the way yeah. the yeah. dollar, right? Right. right. Because yeah, I guess. Yeah. The thing about the dollar it, to be a, a reserve currency like that, where like everyone wants it and everyone mm -hmm. wants your dollar denominated, you know, federal government debt and stuff is that you can move in and out of it very easily. Mm -hmm. Right. That. You, you have all these US government securities. You're the, you know, Bel Belgium, big company in Belgium. You're holding some of your cash as US government securities. If you need to turn that into money to go invest in something, you can do it. You don't have to worry about the US like closing its, closing down and erecting barriers to movements of capital. China does not allow free, you know, free and open movement of finance in and out of its country. It's all, you know, it's regulated. Mm -hmm. so they'd have to, but, you know, the two of them could definitely, you know, get together and do something. I don't think it would affect us too much. Yeah. I actually think that the U.S., the U.S. has, being, being the reserve currency has allowed us to avoid making hard decisions. What do you mean? It, because we, we run trade deficits. For the past 40 years, we've run trade deficits virtually every year, with a couple exceptions in the 90s, I think, under, under Bill Clinton. Uh huh. What that means is we're always spending more than we earn. Okay. Because the rest of the world is happy to hold these dollar denominated deposits mm -hmm. and you know, US government debt. And if that weren't the case, we would have to. We'd have to, you know, we'd be we'd be more constrained in what we spend money on, mm -hmm. and maybe we would make better dis made better choices. I don't know. So you don't this. Um, my, as I said, my friend who's a cold trader said, in fact, that the Russia Russia and China had really teamed up. One that China would back Russia in this current war. And secondly, that they would begin to establish their own financial system. Um, and based on what, I don't know, some kind of a cryptocurrency, I don't know that either. And I don't know, honestly, I guess none of us know what any of this really means. But when the allegation is that Vladimir Putin has not thought this through and that he took, he, I think understood all the risks. So my question is, he must have understood in some way that China was gonna back him and that they were going to emerge as a new kind of, as you say, trading block at least, or at least as an alternative to the Western monopoly, by the way, in a way of Western capitalism or something. Yeah. I don't know, what do you think? He's not a moron, Putin. No. no. And, and we know that he was, 
you know, when you, I was, many of us have read these stories that, you know, talk about Putin's writings over the years. Yes, right. right. And it's all, none of, the, none of this is very surprising when you come. No, it shouldn't that. be surprising. Apparently and, it is been very surprising to yeah. the elites in this country, which yeah. is, which is terrible, the thought of that, that they are surprised by this, right? Yeah, I agree. I mean, he just feels that it's just not good to have one superpower, you know, right. e.g. Right. the U.S., Mm -hmm. And that there need to be, in, in many people argue that the, the Cold War was kind of a, there was this balancing out of, it was stable in a way, right? Mm -hmm. Because even though it was a Cold War, you know, both sides were kind of constrained by the other and, you know, we op kind of knew what the right. rules of the game were, you know? Right, exactly. Um, but now it's like, and I think that this is what is destabilizing is kind of, well, what are the rules? You know, now we don't, we don't have, there was a kind of an implicit almost understanding with the Soviet Union, you know. There of, was, yeah. Of what each side would and wouldn't do. Right, right. right. And now we've lost that. I mean, that, that's what's fundamentally destabilizing about this situation, that no one knows, you know, just how far it's going to go. Or how it's going to affect the United States of America either. I mean, I think that... I don't, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't look to me, it looks to me in a way that Russia has kind of put us in a situation of not being able to do much, not being able to control the situation very much at well, all. He's, you know, he's, he's a sly fox, that one. I know. Well, yeah, crazy like a fox. You know? Crazy like a fox. I mean, he, he is, he's able to do what he's doing, mm -hmm. knowing that NATO will be restrained. Yeah, it seems to me. I hope so. Don't you? I mean, I hope, I hope so. That. We all hope that. I know it. And you knowing know. that NATO really can't, there's a limit to what NATO can do. Um, you know, and so, but I think that it's, I'm seeing, I'm not seeing a clear met signal from China that they're on board with all this. I think they're trying to figure out what they, what they well, should. Well, I maybe, maybe, but this is also a huge... I, I hope, I don't know if Eric Onero is still here. Eric is from Ivory Coast and he um, had a very, he's a colleague of mine. We're trying to build together something called the People's Law School. Anyway, he was just in Africa and he was very surprising in what he told me about that visit. I had not expected this information. When he was there, he saw overwhelming support for Putin, overwhelming. And if you think about it, the support for Ukraine and policies which would favor Ukraine is largely in the white European capitalist West. We haven't heard anything about how Latin Americans feel about this or their governments. We haven't heard really much about what Africans feel. We haven't heard much about the way Asians, except that I have at least read that China is backing Russia. So we have most of the world that we don't even know what they think about this war. And then he tells me that in Africa, at least what he observed were posters for Putin all over the place. What does that mean? What does it mean when if the entire third world has been ignored by the West in this struggle, which I think it has, including the fact that now Biden has to go to Maduro, a man that he had uh, a country that I think having all the presidents sanctioned Maduro and made their life in Venezuela miserable. And so now all of a sudden they're going hand in, you know, with a handout to Maduro and Saudi Arabia. And who's the other one? There's a third, right? What? Nicaragua, no, not Nicaragua. Not Nicaragua. Venezuela, um, Saudi Arabia, Iran. 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 Iran I yeah. thought they were the bad guys. You know, so in other words, I don't know what happened in anybody's consciousness about the whole third world. And what are they thinking about this? Are they going to drift into this camp with Russia and China? They might. I don't know a lot about the current African economic situation, but 
My well, it's been uh, obviously in the same as in Cuba and the same yeah, as in yeah. the Caribbean. It's been penetrated by China. Oh yeah, I was going to say China. I think yeah, there's right, a lot of right, investment right. from the People's Republic, exactly. much more so than from Russia. But now Russia and China, what if they're really together? Well, I think it all. I think that there. A lot depends again on what the People's Republic does. Yes, exactly. And do, are they then in the driver's seat in, the, in all of this? And is that such great news for the, for the United States? You know? And what is, by the way, if you could just, I think um, I do have a further question unless somebody else says about cryptocurrency. What is this thing about cryptocurrency and, and Bitcoin? Is that some kind of a, uh, a developing alternative currency to the dollar or what? Yeah, so the, we you had a good presentation on yeah. this a couple of weeks ago, a month ago maybe. Um, and I think that there's different views. I mean, the, the, the person who spoke early, you know, a month ago, whenever it was, I think does see crypto as a possible emerging, emerging currency. Um, I see it more as an asset, kind of like a stock, um, mm -hmm. kind of like gold. It's kind of like the 21st century version of gold that if you want to hold something that is kind of liquid, that is you know easy to sell, relatively easy to sell, that isn't issued by a government, isn't issued by a bank, which is also what gold is, right? Yeah. Then crypto. Um, and that maybe it's kind of a bet that if crypto takes off, then anyone who owns crypto today is going to become very wealthy. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, and I think it's, so, uh, so you don't see it as an alternate economy in a way, right? That would under a little, little parallel economy. Some people yeah. are using yeah. it to buy, you know, you, but it's very specialized kinds of things you can buy with crypto, right? Mm -hmm. You're not going to go to the grocery store and get, get your milk and eggs with crypto. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't see it replacing the, you know, the, the, the kind of banking system anytime soon. Um, I don't really, I don't really see that. Okay. So therefore, and there's also, I believe a move in China to develop a digitized currency, correct? Is that going to yeah. happen here? Is that going to happen here? Well, is what what is digital currency? I don't know. You Do tell me. Use their phones to buy stuff. Yeah, right. You know that's yes. a digital currency basically. Mm -hmm. But it's all linked back to a bank deposit somewhere. All right. Okay. Okay. It's just you're using you're accessing it electronically. You know, all so right. Okay. So does anybody ever have any questions for Jane? So I really need. I would love it, Jane, if you could sum up and just tell us the future. What do you think is going to be the state of the American economy, at least, over the next couple of years, before the midterms, too, right? The midterm elections. But I'm not, I'm not interested in that, but I am interested in what you perceive is going to be the immediate effect of all this on the ordinary American life. Yeah. Well, ordinary Americans are going to be spending more on energy to heat, heat their homes, to drive their cars, and they're going to be spending more on, on essential foods, basic food. The bread is going to cost more, and that'll like spread through other kinds of goods. You know, if you buy meat, meats are probably going to go up, and people are going to have to be, you know, um, cutting back in other places maybe cutting back on the, the quality of the food that they buy um, in order to continue to um, keep themselves going. Um, and that's all separate from, you know, the whole housing crisis where, you know, we, we have this perpetual shortage of housing, um, particularly, you know, affordable, deeply affordable housing. Um, and we, we, that's a fundamental problem what kind of blows my mind is that you almost never hear anyone talking about that in Washington, D.C., so Sandy. So talk about a disconnect. Mm -hmm. you know, if we were able to deal with that, it would make all these other problems much more, much easier to deal with. 
And that's including in Vermont, right? And in Burlington in particular, right? Very much so, mm -hmm. very much so. So um, it'd be great to have a section on maybe one of these on, you know, housing and what we what we should be doing. You know, well, that, yes, that's a bit, I, uh, in fact, I had a couple of homeless people come to see me today um, about, I mean, that's a real, that's a problem even in Burlington is homelessness still. Um, and you wonder about how on earth people survive, you know, how are they doing it? And um, because that's going to only increase, it seems to me, right? Absolutely. So how is all this going to affect the midterms in your opinion? Probably not good for the Democrats. But the Republicans are not offering any real solutions, particularly to this war. They are, that's, as you said, the war has bipartisan support. Does it have the support of the American people? I don't think so. But who are they going to then vote for since both parties are the same, right? Um, there is, as many people have always felt, a pro-war party in Washington and always has been, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, anybody else have any final thoughts before we thank Jane and mention that next week we will be Vicki, the Vermont Institute of Community and International Involvement and the People's Law School will be presenting um, an update on the situation in, in Ukraine with um, my attorney friend, Kurt Maida, who will offer his scholarship. He's done a lot of research on the situation in Ukraine and we'll be here to give us an update. So thank you very much, Jane, and I hope to see everybody next week. Thanks a Thanks lot. For having me. Yeah, yes, thank you. you. I'm sure we'll talk again, I hope. So, yeah, me too. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, bye bye. bye, -bye.